Are we live? Can I uh, can I just start? Hey guys, can you hear me? Say yes if you can hear me. Um, hey, I see a bunch of guys uh, saying hi. Here we go. Um, let's now check. Do you hear some brass? I'm just going to play something. Did you guys hear that? Good, good, good. Loud and clear. Okay. The day is here. The brass library will come out today. And I'm very, very, very happy that we finally get uh, to this point. Uh, I really would like to emphasize this is not the masterclass. The masterclass is something else. We will do that in the beginning of the new year, and that is only for the people who pre-ordered. And that will be roughly a three-hour event uh, where it's one-on-one -on -one with the people that uh, uh, pre-ordered the brass. We really go into depth how you use the brass and um, how I can help you become uh, a better composer with it and everything else uh, that has something to do with that. So that is for the new year, only for the people who pre-ordered. But nevertheless, I wanted to do a Ustream, uh, YouTube stream live uh, with you guys uh, to answer as many questions that I can that you uh, guys might already have. Um, and um, at this point, I have the... the the 12 tenor bones uh, loaded. Uh, and I want to go through quickly through uh, some of these uh, articulations. All the brass instruments have the same set of articulations, which is a, um, a patch, sustain patch with a strong attack. It's a sustain patch with a soft attack. It's a sforzando. It's a marcado long, marcado short, staccato, staccatissimo, and most of the instruments also have rips, except for the tenor bones. And um, sustain is possible on all these articulations if you want. Uh, obviously, it's the most effective on the, on the legato patches, uh, on, the, on the sustain patches, I would say. Um, now, I want to go to my staccato patch. I have everything set up with key switches right here. Uh, and then in Cubase, I have my expression maps, so it's very easy uh, to draw my uh, uh, articulations. Having that said, though, um, the sustain patch with the strong attack pretty much gets you through everything because it has a strong attack. And with the mod wheel going through the dynamic layers, you could already program a lot of the articulations that you need. So special recordings for this um, are not necessarily necessary. Uh, so I know that a lot of libraries have done swells and, and uh, uh, sforzando recordings and all kinds of lengths. Uh, uh, but technically, this is so well recorded and programmed, you almost don't need it because you can program it yourself. So let's just play a little bit. So these are the 12 tenor bones in uh, legato modes with strong attack patch. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, somebody said the sound is bad. Do we have, um, okay, I guess it's good. We're testing it here at the same time. So maybe you have not a great uh, uh, stream, unfortunately. Okay, so now let's go to the poly patch with the strong attack. And uh, I want you to go, I want to go through the five dynamic layers so you really, hear what they what they feel like. So this is the softest layer. Uh, and I'm gonna switch the microphone off here for a second. 
Uh, so there's no sound bleeds coming from my microphone. So that's going through the, the five dynamic layers uh, as individual sounds. And especially, um, yeah, the sound is coming straight out of the DAW at this point. Um, so when I go back to my softest layer, It feels so incredibly smooth. And I've never heard tenor bone sound so smooth and soft and, and warm. Even if you go uh, way up the, 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 the register. Very, very, very smooth sound. And um, okay, let's uh, play some uh, swells with the mod wheels so you can hear the, the dynamic range and how you can program swells and things like that. So it's very easy to program um, these uh, these swells or for your own for Sanders if you want. But let's go to some of the other articulations. So this is the the soft attack. Uh, sustains. So this is not done artificially with like sample editing or such. This is really a completely separate recording. So very, very, very smooth. Um, so let's go to a different articulation, which is the uh, Sforzande. Uh, so here we recorded five dynamic layers of the Sforzande, which sounds like this. <laughs> so that's the Sforzande. Um, here we have the Mercado Long. Also in five dynamic layers. Mercado Short. Also in five dynamic layers. Sorry, what? The mic is still up. Okay. Uh, so the sound is apparently coming through my mic uh, too loud. So if I play something, I will uh, I will mute it. So I'm going to mute the microphone right now. Uh, so I'm going to go through the Mercados one more time. Uh, so there's a Mercado long, Mercado short, and then um, 
uh, staccato, and then staccatissimo. So those are the four I'm going to focus on right now. Here we go. So there I went through the Mercado long, Mercado short, and the staccato and the staccatissimo. Um, the staccatissimo uh, is, um, is uh, very, very short. And uh, because of the round robins, you can really program the double and the triple uh, tongue technique pretty well uh, without having to need a separate recording for that and uh, to avoid the machine gun effect. So uh, the demo that I did um, that is uh, uh, part of the trailer that came out five, six days ago has a lot of double and triple tongue technique in the trumpets and in the, and in the horns and in the tenor bones that so you could hear there uh, that uh, you can really avoid uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the machine gun effect, uh, if you will. Uh, I'm just going to say something to my guys over here. Um, Isham, uh, can you collect questions? Because it goes so incredibly fast, I can't keep up, uh, keep up with it. Just if you can collect a few and just write them on a the paper or something like that. Uh, okay, so we'll get to, uh, we'll get to questions in a, in a, in a second. Um, okay. Let's talk about something else, um, and that is uh, many many people have asked me about this. Let's see if this thing is working. Okay, so obviously this is a um, a brass library with uh, the brass instruments in uh, their purest form, uh, how they would appear in a natural film score, but nevertheless you can do some really great experimentation with this. Uh, so the sign player allows you to open up the range for each instrument. So when you load the instrument for the first time, um, uh, you'll have the natural ranges of uh, the instruments from a certain note to a certain note. But you can open it up all the way to the top and you can open it way, uh, up all the way to the bottom. So I made this patch that I'm going to play for you right now, which basically has every instrument of the brass family in there and opened up to um, uh, a level that is unnatural for the instrument. But you can get really, really great effects. So listen to this. I'm going to mute my microphone. Uh, and now you can really hear if you wanted to go for that really aggressive uh, Mad Max type sound uh, or 300 Rise of an Empire or what I recently did on uh, Terminator, a very aggressive, almost unnatural brass sound, but it's just so awesome. And that's why I built this patch. So I'm going to mute my microphone and I'm just going to play around uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this thing. So I'm going to mute my microphone. You see, you can hear me there. Uh, so here we go.
So that patch actually goes down to A minus one. Obviously a trumpet cannot go there, but artificially you can. And the sign player is able to open that all up. So this patch that I just played has one tuba, three chimbasos, uh, three bass trombones, 12 tenor bones, 12 horns, and six trumpets. And uh, you can really create really incredible sounds with that. Um, some of the questions that I, um, that I see here are like, uh, is this it? And uh, obviously, no. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you what is, uh, what, what is coming next. I mean, it, it's clear a few articulations are missing from this set. But um, when we discussed with Orchestral Tools, what would be the first bulk of instruments that we want to release? Also to avoid that um, we build a, a library that was so large and would be so expensive, uh, it, it would just be too much. But we wanted to do something that was 100% uh, compatible within the brass instrument range. So if you do a sustain patch, the sustain patch should be 100% compatible with other sustain patches from the same library. The same for the staccatos. So many libraries out there have two dynamic layers for the horns, and then they have three dynamic layers for the trumpets, and maybe one dynamic layer for the tuba, and then three dynamic layers for the staccato, and then two dynamic layers for the staccatissimo. And it's just a, a mess of, of everything. Um, uh, so I see a question, why did you do a library without mutes? Well, I just explained that. We first wanted to focus on the bread and butter uh, articulations, which are two types of sustains, a, a fast attack, a slow attack. We wanted to make sure that everything can be legato if you want, and proper legato with five dynamic layers. Five dynamic layers on all the articulations, super consistent throughout the whole library. So if you program um, staccatos on your horns, ba -ba -da -ba, ba -ba -da -ba -ba, and you get the velocities right and the dynamics, you can immediately copy that to the trumpets and to the tenor bones and to the bass drum bones, open up the MIDI parts, just change the voicing and the notes, and it will sound perfectly in balance uh, with the rest because the philosophy of the five dynamic layers, where the sounds switch to a different dynamic layer, is consistent throughout the whole library. Um, and it, in, in order to do that really properly, it took a lot of time recording. It took a lot of time um, um, with uh, orchestral tools and the programmers to get it really, really right. But also the players. Uh, that's why we spent so much time recording that uh, we constantly checked if a mezzo forte on the horns was actually the same mezzo forte as we did on the tenor bones. And if it was not, we had to re-record that. Um, so um, somebody's talking about legato runs. Um, okay, so let's go there. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, my horns. <laughs> going to my legato mode. Okay. Now, I'm not a great keyboard player, uh, um, but there will be uh, videos um, uh, uploaded in the next week or so. We did a bunch of studio times that uh, uh, are specifically uh, for this brass library. Um, but this is how the legato mo uh, uh, mode works, for instance, in the horns. So I'm just going to mute my microphone for a second. So first I'm doing a couple of slow, and then I'm going to do a couple of fast. So I switch back and forth between the the fast and the, and and the, some of the slow stuff. But 
I'm not the I'm not the greatest uh, uh, piano player, so it works way better if if we were to to program that. Again, there's like um, uh, YouTube videos uh, uh, videos on that that are uh, coming up. Um, uh, there's a question I hear mono. It's definitely not mono, guys. We have uh, two people here testing it at the same time. You might have a, a bad stream or something. Uh, it's definitely stereo. Um, Let's see. Um, do we have some uh, questions that uh, I can answer? Did you compile a few? Let's put it right here. Uh, okay, first question. Nick Saya, what was it that was specifically missing from other libraries that made you want to make Jake's or Brass? What specifically does it do what was missing for you? Well, for starters, guys, what I'm missing in most of uh, uh, the libraries out there is proper soft brass that sounds super, super warm. Again, I'm going to grab one example. I'm going to grab the chimbasos. Now, the chimbasos by nature, uh, uh, one second. So the chimbasto by nature uh, is known as a very aggressive uh, uh, instrument. And the reason why I'm picking this instrument right now um, is because uh, soft horns are out there. Uh, we all know that. Uh, tenor bones is already a problem. Like most libraries do not offer a super butter silk, um, um, smooth, soft sound. So let me play the chimbasos very, very soft. I'm going to mute my microphone for a second, and here we go. they go from super quiet to super, super loud. Um, and that is the second part that I was missing in most of the libraries where um, the sounds really get as loud as it gets from a brass instrument, but still obviously in um, a very musical way, uh, to be clear. So, and in order to do that, we decided to focus on five dynamic layers from pianissimo, pianissimo to like fortissimo, and everything in between with super soft layering between the samples when you use your uh, mod wheel. And um, um, I think that the, the issue with most of the libraries is, and I, I, I get it. I mean, like if you release like a super massive library, you just have to cut corners somewhere, like quicker recordings or um, messier loop points or uh, less round robins or lesser quality players. I, 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 I get all that. Um, and that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to create something that was super consistent, really good sounding and uh, super playable for, for everybody out there. Um, another thing I would like to talk about for a little bit is um, uh, the mixes in this library and the microphone positions. So the library comes with 16 microphone positions, um, which are divided in two groups. One group is completely not processed. Uh, it's the natural sound of the microphones, and um, you can do your own processing with it if you, if you like. Um, the second set uh, of microphones is the mix that I made that I made with Alan Meyerson, and we both worked uh, together on this side to side uh, to create a very hyped uh, film scoring uh, sound. But not everybody likes that hyped sound, and that's why we're offering 
the natural microphone position. So uh, you can determine that for yourself. Now, the beautiful thing of this brass library in combination with uh, the sign player is that once you set up your own microphones the way that you like them, you just merge all these microphones into one audio stream, which means that you can run this library even on an older computer uh, with less processing, um, and uh, you're able to play just that mix that you made. The cool thing is also you can make multiple uh, mixes, uh, and that allows you to have separate uh, mixes for each project. So let's say you work on a very orchestral uh, arrangement, like in the style of John Williams, for instance, and you basically just want to use the tree and the room mic to create a, a natural orchestral sound, and you create your stream and you save that, but then the next time you work on uh, a project where you need a very close mic uh, brass sound because you're doing something more in the, in the style of big bands or very punchy, like very punchy brass bands kind of stuff, um, and you make a different mix. And then another project is when you work on a really big, uh, production uh, Hollywood movie, and you want to use all your microphones to create this really big sound and then mix that down. So you can create your own streams. And um, so that is what, what, what that is. I see a question. Brass effects, something you would consider to maintain with the Jake's Brass setup, Graph Low Ends, uh, Alitoric. Peter Cetera is, uh, is asking that. And um, yes, that is coming. Uh, one of the things that I promised uh, last year doing NAM is that I did a huge amount of sound design uh, on brass and uh, also huge amount of brass effects. Um, and that is a separate thing that is going to be released. Uh, I don't know when uh, yet, but that is a uh, separate thing. Um, let's see. Let's look at another question. Jim Session, I'm really interested in how you approach Divisi. If you play a triad on a 12, a 12 patch, doesn't it make that 32 players? Yes, it does. Um, so the way that I work is um, I have, uh, so if we go to the 12 horn patch, so the 12 horn patch I would use uh, for, um, um, you know, big heroic lines where all 12 horns are playing that line. So usually I have 12 horns when I record a, a, a film score. And um, so when it's a big monophonic heroic line, I will play it with the 12 horn patch. Now, if I were playing two notes uh, at the same time in the, in the brass, um, then I would use the A6 patch. And so that together will... Uh, give us 12 horns. Uh, triads are usually played on the A4, uh, A4 patch, uh, so that makes it 12. Uh, and then there's combinations possible of, uh, of stuff. So if you have um, uh, um, a three chord or a four chord, um, a four note chord, but still with a line on top, then potentially I would program that with the solo horn and then with the A6 patch, I would play whatever the theme is. Uh, and so we divide the, the, the horn players up. But usually I don't go over more than um, a three note divisi within the, within the horn group, uh, unless it's an effect where, where they all play their own notes with like detuning to get like a certain brooding effect. Um, but usually it's maximum uh, divisi is three. Um, and um, on the other hand, when you work with, uh, with uh, samples and you want to create something that's really larger than life, uh, like I did with um, um, uh, Max, for instance, then all that theory is like out of the window and you create something that's really monstrous and really big. So uh, on Mad Max, technically, if you were to count the amount of brass players, it would be like 100 <laughs> or something like that because uh, I did so much artificial resampling, live recordings, double the live recordings, then do processing of that on top of that, add that with extra brass to it from programming. Uh, so it's uh, it, in that case, 
it's it, you throw it out of the window what is natural and what it, what is possible. But for people that write just for samples out there, uh, the idea was to create something that you can really build that massive Hollywood sound if you want. But I also wanted to create a library for people that want to do pure orchestral mock-ups uh, and with a really high quality sound. And um, like I've said before, for people that join later, we haven't done all the articulations yet um, because we wanted to release something that was super consistent and very high quality instead of like doing all the articulations in the world, but cutting, cutting corners everywhere um, just to make that uh, possible. So I'm sure we're going to do uh, future articulations. I mean, there's a couple of things that I would really like to see uh, in this library in the future, things like uh, muted and stopped horns, uh, cup mutes for the for the tenors and the trumpets, uh, trills, um, things like that. So these are all things that we're going to discuss in the future. But obviously, we also have to see if the library that we have created so far is going to be successful enough to warrant uh, a, a proper a proper update on that. Um, but uh, I mean, I have a, a list of lots of stuff that I would that I would like. And don't forget, guys, this library, at first, I wanted to develop this just for myself. And uh, it was not down the road that we decided, you know, you know, finally, I have the brass library that I want. And we should really share this with everybody so people can, can buy this and, um, you know, and, and really enjoy uh, making uh, music with it. Uh, let's look at another question here. Uh, oh, I just kind of uh, answered that. Will Jake sell brass have more articulations in the near future, like expansion, sound design, brass, and more? I, I answered that question uh, a couple of times. Um, hey, Tom, can you talk about vibrato? Is there vibrato recorded on or, or LFO? Um, actually, we didn't record um, a vibrato. We just did like a, the pure uh, orchestral tone at, uh, at, uh, at first. Uh, personally, I'm I am not a big fan of uh, vibrato in certain in certain instruments. You always get the the great detuning effect when you have multiple horns and when you have um, uh, multiple bones and and bass bones and uh, stuff like that. Uh, so um, I I'm personally not missing potentially that aspect. But if there's um, if there's more people out there that would really like to see uh, vibrato in uh, in the in the instruments. We can definitely discuss that in the in the future. I think an artificial vibrato by in the sampler, just a, you know, a, um, hooking that up with modulation to the sample and just having it do it feels like very very uh, unnatural to me. Uh, so, uh, next question is uh, Mark Batower. Um, when we extend the range, will it extend for the whole instrument or should we do that for each articulation? No, you don't have to do that for each articulation. It's just the instrument. So the moment you open the instrument up, it will work for all the articulations immediately. Um, and uh, that's the, 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 the upsides of this uh, library. Uh, people also have been asking about the, the perch function that people have seen on the player. Uh, the perch function works exactly like you would think it is. Uh, so when you load uh, the whole instrument, you get all the articulations of the instrument automatically loaded. But you can also load each articulation by one and just take it from there. So you can you can customize that. Now, if you were to load the whole instrument with all its articulation um, and you hit the perch function, it's basically going to unload everything. And then when you start playing notes, it starts loading the notes that you're playing. Uh, so you can keep your arrangement very lean in, in uh, sample usage uh, um, to save uh, memory, obviously. Um, now, some people also ask questions about how I've set it up. Uh, I have set it up uh, on uh, an old server unit, unit. I'm just looking at my tech here. It's a, it's a Xeon processor from, what, 2009 or something like that? What? 2012, and what's the processor that we have on there? Yeah, six core, right? Yeah, six core, uh, Xeon processor. So it's a, it's a seven-year-old computer, 
And uh, I have the whole brass library loaded there. I did do pre-mixing myself of, the, of all the microphones. Uh, so I created uh, um, my own mix that I really liked. And we merged those microphone positions into uh, two streams. One stream is going to the front speakers and one stream is going to the back speakers. And, uh, and that's how I created the, the sound for the, for the, for the library. Um, I know it's pretty early to talk about this. This is Yuri Frioni. Uh, I know it's pretty early to talk about this, but are you planning to make other libraries like Jake's or Brass in the future? For instance, strings, woodwinds, percussion, choir, and so forth. There's one library I can announce already, and that is JXL Triangle. All the triangles in the world will sample hundreds of dynamic layers, beautiful crossfades between one triangle to another. No, I'm joking. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about future plans at all. Um, so what I will say about this brass library is that. Um, uh, to, according to me and orchestral tools, this is not it. Um, we have way more plans what to do with uh, JXL Brass, but we wanted to release a, a very incredible sounding basic library first that does everything absolutely right. And um, that was the main goal at first. Um, uh, another question of Nick Saya, will there be expression maps available for downloads? Well, I made them already myself, so I might as well throw them online so you guys can uh, can can use them. I mean, it's it's so very simple uh, to set them up because uh, we have in total one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine articul articulations per, uh, per instrument. Uh, by default, when you load the instruments, um, the key switch is start at C6 and going up, but you can change that and customize that uh, completely yourself in uh, in sign. So you can use key switches, but you could also use uh, velocity switches. You can use control change uh, switches. Uh, you can switch with um, uh, program changes. And there's always uh, the uh, possibility to load up all the instruments individually and just assign them to a unique MIDI channel and then for instance, in Cubase, with the expression map, your MIDI just goes to a different MIDI channel and therefore to a different uh, articulation. Um, you can just do this all the way that you want and the way that you're, uh, that you're used to work. Um, let's see. Peter Satera asks, what sort of approach did Alan Myerson bring to this as he mixes brass without the rest of the orchestra? Well, it's really a project that uh, Alan and I took on myself. Uh, Alan was uh, important in the beginning of the process where we went back and forth what type of microphones to use. I, I had uh, um, a preference for what microphones to use. Uh, he advised also on certain microphones. We did a couple of things that were interesting uh, with microphone placements, for instance, one of the things we recorded was uh, microphones behind the horns. Uh, uh, so not on, I mean, the, the majority of the sound of the horns uh, uh, comes from the back, um, but it's the reflection towards a wall that we now in front of the horns hear the total sound of the horns. But it was interesting to use the microphones in the back of the horns to create like a really interesting uh, sound. Um, the same with room mics and with surround mics. And then when we were done recording, um, uh, I just want to say, I'm, I'm done with these questions. Maybe you can copy paste a few more. Um, so uh, when we were done with the recording, uh, we um, went back to LA and then uh, we set up uh, all the microphones uh, on, on the desk and we started playing with like balance. And then we started to decide what microphones are going to go into one microphone stem. Uh, so the tree was one microphone mix and then the room and then A, B, and then we have surround one and surround two. Um, so we had to decide what microphone is going and where. And then we really got into uh, the processing. So once we were done with the standard microphone settings and, and uh, distribution, um, we created the natural uh, stems uh, which are the first eight 
in uh, the library when you open up the mixer. The first eight channels are the natural sound of the microphones. And the second eight is what Alan and I uh, processed on this. Um, so we've used multiband compressors, dynamic EQs, um, extended reverb. Uh, we added distortion to some of the close mics to get more grit and more uh, bites uh, to it, especially in the louder uh, areas of the of the brass. Um, so we were able to create the sound that I really, really um, uh, want. So um, so that's what was that uh, the most important part of the of the of the sounds uh, to really um make it that th thick and really fat and um so the the patch that i uh just played uh, a little bit before that um oh, let's just focus on the on the the bass bones right now i'm just going to run yeah we have okay we have sounds uh i'm going to switch my microphone off and i'm just going to go through uh uh, various articulations in uh, the bass boats. So my microphone will be off. So those were the bass bones. And a couple of things that I went uh, uh, through it was uh, first the legato patch, um, and then uh, the soft sustains, then the hard sustains. And one of the things uh, you really feel is like the, ba the bass bones, you can play them so soft and buttery quiet to create these really nice choral smooth chords in the lower end of the brass. Um, and uh, and then, of course, they're they're blatantly loud if you if if you want to, and everything in between. We went through Mercado long, five dynamic layers. Mercado short, five dynamic layers, uh, and then uh, the staccatos, marcados, and then the rips. Um, talking about rips, uh, the the horn rips are absolutely phenomenal. So I'm just gonna mute the mic here for a second. I'm gonna play a few.
There you have it. The rips, the 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 rips on the horns, like incredible. Just like and what's really great um, with the with the rips, how you can program them. Uh, you can you can let them run into the one, uh, and then continue programming with the with the staccatissimo or with the staccato, and you get really really incredible. Um, believable things uh, that sound like wow, that is actually life, uh, uh, but it's not. <laughs> it's 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 programmed. So I I have discussions some sometimes. Um, uh, somebody says the sound of this walkthrough is nothing like the 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 or the, the sound of this uh, stream is nothing like the walkthrough. Yeah, absolutely because. Uh, uh, a walkthrough uh, is a proper high quality audio that is then uploaded uh, to uh, YouTube and you can watch it in almost like really good quality. This is a live stream. So if there's like something weird happening here in the building or somewhere else, the, the audio gets compressed uh, to almost uh, uh, nothing. Uh, question, can you tell us something about your work with Zack Schneider? Okay, that was that answer. Uh, next, let's move on. Do we have some uh, more interesting questions? Anyway, um, so with the... Um, um, let's see. Can you explain the surround features? This is by AJ Hazard. Um, well, the surround features are what you make of it, obviously, yourself. Uh, so with the microphone positions that we just discussed, uh, if you want, you could have all these individual microphones uh, coming into your DAW system. Uh, so you would have close one, close two, you have your spot mics, you have your AB mics, your room mics, and surround one and two. And you have uh, the decatry as well, eight. Um, and then you can pan them wherever you want. I mean, there might even be composers out there that uh, have an Atmos uh, set up uh, at home. I don't. Uh, I, I want one in the near future, but I don't have it yet. But then you could really pan these microphones everywhere you want, so you can create a sound that's larger than life. Um, the way that I have set it up is uh, I only use the front speakers and the back speakers, uh, the surround. So I don't use the center speaker. I leave that usually up to the dubbing engineer, who is the guy who will actually mix the film final result, and to determine uh, how much actually goes into the uh, into the center. So usually there's a discussion between me and him, how he sees it, what type of movie it is. Uh, so especially if it's a very loud action movie, um, you usually try to keep the center channel uh, free for dialogue and certain sound effects. If it's a drama movie, it's a whole different ballgame because there are no usually no loud sound effects. And um, yeah, so that is that. Um, high tone, will there be ensemble patches or pure section patches? Well, um, ensemble patches, you can very easily make yourself. Uh, and I, I uh, showed that. So let's go to that instrument one more time. Um, so let's see, do we have sounds? <laughs> We have. I'm going to mute my microphone. I'm just going to play through this a little bit and I'm going to explain you what this is. So what we just um, listened to uh, is a combination of each instrument in the library in there. Uh, so the trumpets are in there, horns are in there, chimbato, uh, the, the tenor bones, uh, and the tuba, and the bass drum bones. And I've actually extended the ranges so the trumpet now goes down to A, Z, A minus 1. 
Uh, the tenor bones go down to A minus 1. The horns go down to A minus 1. The tuba now goes down to A minus 1. And the bass trombones and the chimbasso. And I'm able to play um, artificial uh, patches. But obviously, when you do play in the range of all these instruments, so for instance, this chord here, Every instrument can play that range. Uh, even the tuba can get that high. Um, so um, that is uh, interesting. So now you're having uh, trum uh, trum trumpets and tubas and horns uh, and tenor bones uh, playing together in the, in the same range. So it's very easy to make your own patches. Uh, and um, it's, um, it, it, it's just very easy. And this is like besides the standard patches that you can load. So the way that I have set it up um, is uh, I have on a VSL machine, a V-frame with all the standard uh, uh, instruments. So I've got my 12 horns and then I've got my six horns, my four, my one horn, and then I've got 12 tenors, six tenors, three tenors, one tenor. Um, then I have uh, six trumpets, three trumpets, one trumpet, uh, three contrabass uh, trombones, and then my three chimbasso and my one tuba. And then I have a separate V-frame where I'm basically creating instruments that I like to create. So uh, a combination of horns with tenors or a combination trumpets with horns or a combination bass bones and chimbassos with tuba. Uh, so this is all very um, easy to set up. Uh, uh, how many instruments do you have loaded at the same time uh, for Divisi? Um, well, uh, I really don't at this point. So I have one of each loaded, uh, and that's how I write at this uh, specific point. Uh, so even if you write for Divisi, you can easily do that uh, on a four-horn patch. But if you wanted to load it up uh, double, you can uh, so an interesting feature of the sign player is that within one instance of the sign player, if you load the, the, the 12 horn patch up three times, the two other instruments will share the samples of the first one that's loaded. Uh, so it will not load the instrument three times and the samples three times. It will just load up the instrument because the data is being shared of the first load. So technically, you could load up uh, if you want, 12 individual solo horn instruments of which only of one instrument all the samples are loaded. The other 11 will share the samples of the first one loaded because they are identical. So uh, let me know if that makes sense. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's a really great feature. Um, something we discussed, like how, how to avoid you know, excessive loads and things like that. Uh, the other thing that's really cool, uh, we've tried it actually here, but um, I'm not sure with the final version of the player how this is going to work out. But after installing and after creating all your microphone mixes yourself, you can take technically take a lot of microphone mixes information off or out of the sign player folder and store them on an external hard drive and keep it somewhere. So your internal hard drive is not clocking up with a huge amount of data that you're not using. And always in the future, you can copy them back and then just do something else with it. Also in the future, um, and but this is more questions for Orchestral Tools. Um, because I'm not uh, obviously Ocasio Tools, I'm just Tom that wanted to make a brass library. Um, but uh, there is that whole system in the future to buy instruments a la carte, including the microphone. So you can say, I just want the, the tree mic from the 12 horn patch, that's all I want. I don't want the rest. Uh, or I just want the surround uh, mics for the trumpets. And then you can just buy that. Um, but I don't know um, how that exactly works in the future, but this is stuff that we discussed. Um, a question from Russ8889, how long have you wanted to make this library? Well, I wanted to make a brass library forever, uh, and um, it's not really um, an easy process. You know, I've made a lot of libraries myself, 
I've resampled a lot of brass libraries uh, myself and rebuilt them and reprogrammed them. And I know the amount of time that goes into it. And um, this library is so complicated under the hood when it comes to programming and the intelligent um, switching between different types of crossfades and everything. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, like a lot of work. And uh, so uh, in total, we've been working on this for two years. Um, so it's 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 a very comprehensive uh, uh, process. I can uh, I can say. Um, let's see. I'm going to give this computer back uh, to uh, somebody uh, for potential more questions. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Question: Can we remap articulations to MIDI controllers instead of keys? Uh, neural minds. Yes, you can. You can completely set up how you want this to set up. You could, um, I have it set up with key switches because that's what I like. Uh, I know, for instance, Hans Zimmer likes to use control change. Uh, so you can set this up with control change, no problem. You pick a controller and then whatever level is the input is now determining you know, what articulation is, play, is, is playing. Um, the other thing you can do is set it up in the sign player um, with um, uh, velocity switching, if that's what you want. And then with the mod wheel, you control the dynamic range. So I love, for instance, the dynamic range on the staccatos. I'd like to do that with velocity. But there's other people that like to use the controller for that. Uh, so you can do that, no problem. Um, there's, uh, you can set it up with program changes. I mean, program changes are something a little bit from the past, but if you have a hardware sense, uh, like a DX7, and you want to switch through preset one through eight, that corresponds with the different articulation. You can set it up with program change, no problem. Um, and then internally, the sign player also has this uh, performance mode where you can set it to poly, where you now can completely program uh, the set of articulations yourself, and you can crossfade between all these different types of articulations depending what you want. So this doesn't even need to be. Um, just the horns. You can make uh, a combination between horns and tenors and trumpets uh, by just playing live, and then you get different combinations of these instruments together or separately. Again, completely what, uh, what, uh, what you want. Question, can we get the soundtrack of Justice League? No. Next question. Um, uh, oh. Uh, let's see, I want to see this thing. Similar to how you is, uh, this is Eric uh, Hinton, uh, enable double articulations without the separate articulations. Oh yeah, so this is about the, the double and triple uh, tonguing, um, which in this library, uh, we did not record uh, as a, a separate articulation yet. Um, so this is one of the uh, things that, um, I feel passionate about, and that is sound for me is very important. Like in the past, when I would use um, a double or a triple tongue sample from uh, from a library, but the tempo wasn't right, then you need to uh, adjust the tempo, and then the time stretching kicks in of uh, contact or or any other sampler, and then um, you get that really heavily degraded sound, and and it's I just don't like that sound of it. Uh, unless you start recording double and triple tonguing, multiple tempos, multiple tempos, and all the different notes, uh, which is like a massive undertaking, and I don't really see um, uh, the, 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 the reason for doing that. So um, then the next question becomes, how are we going to uh, imitate double and triple tonguing? And that is with... Uh, a really good staccato sound and a really good staccatissi uh, mo sound. And with enough round robins, with very consistent recording and playing, and that's how you can create really good double tonguing, triple tonguing techniques, um, um, the closest thing to it, let's put it that way. And uh, that could really be uh, a really good uh, example how to do this right. So in the demo that I did, um, that is now uh, part of the of the trailer. 
the trailer music that came out five, six days ago. Um, there's a couple of examples of that in there, like, pa -pa -pa -pa, pa -pa -pa -pa, pa -pa -pa -pa, um, where uh, that technique is being being used. And the way that we recorded the staccatissimos and the staccatos, uh, again, very consistent throughout all the instruments. That's another thing I, I really never liked about uh, other brass libraries is that the staccato on one instrument is has a completely different length than the other instrument, and the staccatissimo sometimes sounds more like a staccato, and a staccato sometimes sounds more like a staccatissimo. And then marcados are all over the place with all the brass libraries. So these ones are really, really consistent. Uh, exactly the same length, the same intention, and the same uh, um, uh, articulation well played. Uh, so that is um, a really strong uh, um, pro of of this of this library that you can imitate double and triple tonguing uh, really really well. I'm just looking at the questions here. Um, what were the strings used in that demo? I mean, we're just sidetracking here. Uh, that's uh, my version of the cinematic uh, strings, the old library that came out. So it's not CS strings two. It's the old library that came out, and I. Uh, resampled the whole library and just uh, so it, it has more the sound that that I want. Um, question: Is there a real difference between legato between the twelve horn patch from Cinebrass Pro and the twelve horns from JXL Brass? Yeah, I mean, there's a massive difference. Uh, for starters, uh, I think Cinebrass is only two dynamic layers, or maybe three. Uh, ours is five. Uh, and also five dynamic layers in the legatos. And we have a slow attack, we have a fast attack. And the fast and the slow attack is also recorded over um, uh, five dynamic layers. And these are unique recordings. These are not uh, staccato overlays or marcado overlays. This is actually a unique uh, recording. And uh, so it took a lot of time to get that really right, but there's a, um, um, a massive, a massive difference. Um, let's see. Mm. Do we have some more questions, guys? Because it's going. Uh... Ah, okay, okay. Uh, question: Will it work well with expression maps? Yes, it works really well with expression maps, and uh, that's how I have it set up here in uh, in, uh, in in uh, in Cubase. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, this is a good one. Are the portamentos and the legatos adjustable? So. Um, this is more of a sign question, a less of a JXL brass question, but um, there will be a separate video on that on Orchestral Tools. But there's all kinds of settings uh, that you can make in the in the legato portion of the sign player, uh, where there's things like you can adjust the level of the of the um, the the legato section uh, or the portamento section between the notes. Um, second, you can choose. Uh, what type of legato you want, whether it's a fast legato or a run type uh, legato or a slow legato. So that little section of uh, the sign player has a lot of different parameters that you can uh, play with. Uh, the other thing that's really cool is um, uh, is uh, things that you can do with the dynamic range of the of the layers. So there is um, a soft layer available in the player and also uh, a filtered layer and also uh, niente. So niente is a function where if the mod wheel goes to zero, the volume will also be zero. There's nothing coming out of the sampler. If niente is off, if you put the mod wheel down, you just hear the, the, the softest articulation of let's say a horn, but how in its natural context. So that's what, what the horn would sound like uh, in real life uh, at its quietest. And um, the soft layer function is interesting because if you click that on, there will be more room on your mod wheel 
to move in between the two, three softer dynamic layers. And then if you really go up to the, to the top, that's when you get the really loud layers. Uh, so it, for people that program more for softer brass, like a standard orchestral setting, they have way more uh, wiggle room with the mod wheel uh, to get those transitions like super, super smooth. And with the soft layer off, um, you, you basically have an equal uh, slope, if you will, from soft to, uh, to, uh, to loud. Uh, this was an ask before, this is the almighty E, but how's the performance RAM CPU usage? Can you purge the samples? Well, I did talk about purge, uh, purging. Uh, so the idea is that when you load an instrument, you can press purge and it's going to throw everything away. And when you start playing, it's going to start loading uh, the little bits of uh, intro bits of the sample one by one based on the notes that you're playing. And then obviously it's streaming. It has uh, a lot of parameters when it comes to uh, optimizing your com uh, your computer, how to stream, buffer size, all these different things. Some of these things I don't even know exactly what they uh, what they uh, mean, um, but you can get really really details into it. Um, CPU usage seems to be very fine. Um, like I said, I have the the whole brass library loaded. I'm using two microphone positions uh, per instrument, and those are the merged microphones mixes that I made myself. And I am able to stream up to 60, 62 um, stereo voices even uh, easily at the at the same time. So that's pretty much more than you would ever need in uh, in a standard brass uh, uh, arrangement. I mean, if you have uh, three horns playing, three trumpets, uh, three horn lines. I mean, three trumpet lines, three tenor lines. Um, uh, one bass bone line, or let's say three bass bone, bone lines and three chimbasso lines and, and two tubas, that, that's still 15. Uh, so in able to get to 60, it's, uh, you have to do some really uh, crazy stuff. Um, and um, for, oh yeah, and Stein, Stein does have a standalone version. Um, and, but I'm using it uh, in uh, Vienna Ensemble Pro. Uh, and I think most of you guys out there are using it in uh, Vienna Ensemble Pro, or maybe some actually loaded up in their in their W uh, them uh, themselves. Um, let's see, were the horns in the Dua Lipa swan song real? Uh, no, they were not. They were uh, actually sampled from an older demo that I did uh, of that uh, of that track. Um, can you show us an example of your custom mix and what mics and volume you used to achieve that mix? Uh, I'm gonna do that separately in a YouTube uh, tutorial uh, and also during the masterclass, I can't sh screen share at this point. Uh, so I can't uh, show, show you that. Ah, question, could you play for us a solo horn? Yes, I can. Uh, let's go to the solo horn. Okay, and I'm gonna switch one microphone off. How was that for a solo horn? Pretty good, huh? Um, so um, what you can do, um, 
I mean, this is not perfect, but what you can do until you decide to do something else. For, so for the traditional uh, orchestral writers among you, you could load up the solo horn, uh, let's say uh, six times if you write for six horns. Um, and if all the horns have an individual part, um, then um, it doesn't bite each other that uh, uh, at all because there will be no facing or whatsoever. When all the lines um, are playing the same melody, you should use the A6 horn patch to then play a, uh, a unisono melody. And when the lines go uh, in their own direction, uh, then you go back to the six individual horn patches that you that you have. Now, if two horn lines are still individual, but four horn lines are now crossing path and join each other on common notes, that's where you should use the A4 patch to fix that. Now, the problem is if you have six individual horns, but only every now and then two horns play the same note or three horns play the same note, uh, a trick that you can use is um, detune the sample patch by half a note in Cubase, uh, bring it up by half a note uh, in your MIDI modifier and Logic has that parameter too in Cubase and, and Pro Tools too. Uh, so therefore, uh, you're actually playing the next played note, but tuned down by a half a note and your MIDI is being offset by half a note. So now the MIDI looks the same and they're now both playing the same note, but it's not the same recording. So you don't get uh, phasing. So this is a trick uh, to, to do that. Uh, unless we get to the, to the point where we actually start releasing more uh, uh, solo uh, instruments. The thing for me is that um, having six individual horn lines playing all the, the different uh, lines, it still doesn't have the, the same effect as uh, having six people in the room playing at the same time because these instruments resonate with each other. Uh, it fills the room in a different way. So um, I sometimes find it sounds to, it to sound more natural by programming a standard orchestral session on an A4 patch instead of four different uh, uh, horn players because samples just work differently and uh, they act differently. Uh, so um, technically when you play a three note chord on the A12 uh, horn patch, technically that would be 36 horn players, but it's also not because in real life, 36 horn players would sound absolutely completely different than three a triad chords on an A12 patch. So it, you can translate it one-on-one -on -one like that. Uh, I've recorded really big brass uh, uh, se uh, sessions, like on um, uh, Mortal Engines, I had a brass uh, section that was almost comparable to uh, some of the Berlioz pieces, and it was massive. We had like 36 players in the room, um, but it didn't sound like, um, 36 players on a sample patch, like in real life, 36 players sounded so much more huge than the equivalent of 36 players in the sample world. In the sample world, I almost had to go up to artificial 60 or 70 virtual players to get that same full sound. Uh, so a triad played on an A12 horn patch uh, sometimes can still sound thinner than actually 12 horns live playing that three note chord. Uh, so that's the difference between actually playing uh, with live instruments or with uh, samples. Let's see if there's some more interesting question. Um, on merging mics, it's not possible, but it's pretty easy to get the original mic positions from the store. Uh, as far as I know, but this is more an orchestral tools question, uh, I think an update in, in the player will be that you can undo your mic mix and then you get your original mics in the settings that you had it and then you can do a small change and merge them again. Uh, something like that, we talked about that. Um, let's see. Uh, Are the trumpet and sax suitable for fast, uh, funky playstyle? Well, 
there's no saxophones in this, but um, if we were to go, let's say, to the to the horns, and then we go to. So I'm at the uh, staccato, staccatissimo. So it's very punchy, and uh, the, the, the reason why I picked the horn, it's very hard to get a horn punchy. Uh, trumpets and trombones, way easier. Um, and uh, so you can really do... It's like very easy. Uh, so um, obviously a lot of classical and orchestral music has staccato, staccatissimo. What is different in the big band brass world is that it's punchy, uh, so tight with with uh, the whole section and the whole group together. Uh, so um, that totally works. Um, let's see. Next question. Is the sustained legato patch polyphonic? No, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a monophonic line. But what I explained before is that you can load up three patches of the same instruments, it will share the samples of the first one loaded, so your load doesn't go up. Uh, and then you can program three individual uh, legato lines for horns or for trumpets, and you will be totally fine. Um, uh, let's see, hey Tom, with higher dynamic range, is recording MIDI automation uh, clips now harder than before without hardware is programming. It's still easy. I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but uh, the dynamic range is, is huge uh, because it goes from uh, pianissimo to fortissimo. Um, and um, for people that write in a natural orchestral environment, they will really love this because uh, we didn't uh, change the, the, the volume of the softer layers, if you will, or normalize them or anything like that. So if I were to open up, uh, uh, let's say my 12 horn patch and I go to the loudest. And that's the quietest, but that is actually the quietest level uh, in the room with the real life players playing that note. So I know that some libraries normalize their samples and then in the sample editing process, they try to um, um, adjust for that and then bring them back down so it kind of doesn't sound as loud. There's also uh, libraries where it, it, it always is as loud except for the dynamic change. Uh, so we didn't do any of that. We kept it completely in the natural world. So, um, if a horn player were to play this, that would be the real dynamic range. Uh, so people that uh, play, uh, that program real orchestral uh, music, they will love the way that this is set up. Uh, people that do more um, um, modern, uh, type film scoring, um, and th they play with all kinds of different elements and effects on, on this stuff, um, it's no problem. I mean, like, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, and so it's easier for the people that use uh, brass in an artificial way uh, to work with a brass library than for people that want to write really uh, straight up orchestral uh, music, because lots of the brass libraries out there uh, fall flat for a lot of these people because they can't really get the natural dynamic range. They can't get the proper legato switching between all the different lines. Uh, so for me, it was very important that the library and the articulations that are available at this, at this specific point in time will surface all these different groups of composers. A TV composer should be totally happy immediately unpacking this library and playing. The same for people who want to program music in the style of how to train the dragon or uh, Star Wars or any any type of 100% straight up orchestral music. And people 
that want to make blatantly loud trailers uh, that sound as intense as Mad Max, for instance. It, this brass library is for all these people. And um, so that was the plan. I have time for one or two more questions, and then I need to actually get back to making money. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I can't pay the rent at the end of the, week, uh, end of the month. Um, let's see. You have mentioned that orchestral recordings sound too thin for modern film score. How do you go about making the other elements uh, sounding well? Um, I I didn't say quite that orchestral recordings sound too thin. Uh, what I'm what I'm heading at is that uh, classical recordings uh, sound very thin. So. I have a lot of amazing vinyl records and CDs uh, from incredible performances, uh, some uh, conducted by Leonard uh, Bernstein, some by from Kar uh, uh, Karajan, uh, some Simon Rattler, just like amazing performances, amazing orchestras. But they usually hang the microphones down from the ceiling and the recording that comes out of it is an incredible uh, performance by the players and interpretation of that piece of music. But if I play that on my speakers here and I compare that, let's say, with Mad Max uh, or with um, uh, Alita or any of the movies that I've done, the orchestral classical recordings, they sound so thin. The stereo image isn't really wide and there's not a lot of low frequencies and a lot of like top high frequencies. Um, so um, I think there's a, a, a lot of progress ha has made in, in pure orchestral uh, recording uh, nowadays, but we can still think, uh, we can still push it more. And obviously this is a matter of taste. So uh, I'm sure that John Williams has a completely different opinion about this uh, than potentially me or potentially Hans Zimmer or potentially Alan Silvestri or Danny Elfman. Everybody has their own style and everybody has their own uh, way of recording uh, what they would like to hear, what they do not like to hear. And I totally respect that. So with this brass library, I wanted to be able to give something to all your composers out there. It doesn't matter what type of style you're going after, that the tone is there, the microphone positions are there, my mixes are there that I did with Alan, and my type of processing is there, and that the library has the five dynamic layers uh, and smooth transitions between everything. Uh, so it doesn't matter what style of music you program, you will be very happy with this uh, brass library. Question, when will be the masterclass? And after that, I'm gonna do one more question and then that's it for me. Um, the masterclass mo most likely will be somewhere in the new year. Um, so the brass library will come out. You guys should play with it for at least uh, 40, 50 days or so. Uh, and uh, um, really um, gather uh, information, uh, not only for yourself, but also for me, like what you, what you like about it, how, you would, how you, you would like information, how to use it, or how I do uh, certain things. Um, and uh, so that will be somewhere in the beginning of the next uh, year. Um, somebody's asking, but I've seen that question uh, before, uh, how does brass blend with Berlin brass? Uh, and for that matter, how does any, any library blend with another library? Now, uh, this is really coming down to, um, on one hand, your experience as a mixer and engineer, but on the other hand, it doesn't matter all that much. I mean, I combine all kinds of different things together, you know, things that I recorded myself, commercial libraries that I've resampled and completely redid from the ground up, other libraries coming straight out of the box, uh, and then now my new brass library, it all doesn't matter that much. It just means a little bit of extra EQ here and there, maybe some little bit more reverb. Uh, it's, um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's not that big, uh, that big of a deal. Um, hey guys, I have to go, I have to go back to work. Um, I wish you all like an incredible, happy, happy holidays. And, uh, I am also going to be, uh, and some of you might have already noticed, I am on VI Control as uh, the real JXL, and uh, I follow all the blogs, and uh, I jump in with uh, questions that people uh, might have. This video will be available for you guys to watch as soon as the stream is over at a certain point. 
Um, and we will be uploading um, uh, videos about this brass library. There will be more videos uploaded by Ocasio Tools. More demos will come. Uh, so we'll keep you informed and we do um, as, uh, as much as we can to uh, give you guys information. Uh, obviously, any questions you might have once this video comes up, leave the comments below. You guys know the trick. I'll come back to it and I'll ask them in the Ask Me Anything. Uh, and there will be a new segment that we're going to be introducing. And that is Don't Ask Me Anything regarding the Justice League Zack Snyder cut, okay? There's not going to be any answer on that. So that's going to be a new topic. Don't ask me anything. Okay? Okay, guys. It was great that you were all here. And uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.